We are here today to yell about the first waiver wire of the year. Last year, I distinctly remember coming on here as a, as a very big fan of Elijah Mitchell as a college prospect. He was one of my guys that, you know, really, really honed in on. He was a dude that I stuck my neck out for, flexed the traps on. And when week one came around and Raheem Mostert went down immediately, Elijah Mitchell was a guy that I told a lot of people to spend a lot of fab on. And then everyone got mad about it. And they were like, the 49ers running back situation is never one to go in on. They're going to use a committee. This guy's a fraud, et cetera. I think the theme of this week's waiver wire, for the most part, there are a few dudes out there that I like, but I think there's a lot of fool's gold going on this week, right? I think there's a lot of players behind players that got injured. And there's a reason they're behind those players because they haven't beat them out and they're not as talented. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of spots here where people are going to blow a lot of fab. And I don't necessarily think this is the week to do so. All right. So we're going to run through the names that people have been yelling about thus far into the week and whether or not I think they're worth picking up. Most of them are worth picking up at a price. But once we start throwing out, you know, you listen to one waiver wire podcast or you read one article and they're just like, yeah, 25% of your budget on every one of these players. Your entire bench is going to be fucking RB7s that you spend all your fab on. That's not the way to operate in this shit. I got no problem spending money, right? Most of the leagues, by the time like week seven rolls around, I got no fab left and I got no fucks about that. I don't care. I'm ready to roll that way. However, you got to do it correctly, all right? We're not looking for a one-week fill-in. We're not looking for a guy who might throw up 13 points in your flex spot one time, and then you blew all your money on it. We're looking for long-lasting longevity. We're looking for players that could be key pieces of your lineup for the entirety of the year. Do we have that in this week? I don't know. Let's start with the running back position. The biggest name to keep an eye on, of course, is Elijah Mitchell, who's going to be out somewhere in like this, anywhere from like five to eight weeks, probably a couple months at this point, which opens up the entire San Francisco backfield. We made a video last week saying that if you were going into the year with Elijah Mitchell, you should probably own Jeff Wilson. Now, Elijah Mitchell's out. Jeff Wilson becomes the number two. The question thus becomes, how valuable is Jeff Wilson going to be? Is he a great pure running back in his own right? No. But this is an offense that makes fantasy running backs. This is an offense that produces on the ground, regardless of who is back there. My concern is this. While Jeff Wilson got all the carries when Elijah Mitchell went out, and Jeff Wilson will probably be the goal line back, we saw really fucking clearly that Debo Samuel is still the best running back on this team. And they uh, fuck all what you heard about the summer. Fuck what I was saying about it during the summer that Debo is going to run the ball less. He's a running back there. He is as much running back as he is wide receiver in San Francisco. You also have a quarterback who's literally a running back. He attempted, I think, 13 rush attempts in week one. So you are talking about the weirdest committee in the NFL. You're talking about a committee between a quarterback, a wide receiver, and now maybe one running back, maybe three running backs. Okay. So Jeff Wilson, while he might look spicy now, the move was to get him pre-draft. The move was to get him in your draft. The move was to get him before week one. The move is not to spend 100% of your fab on Jeff Wilson in this week, okay? Because they also have two other running backs that could very well play a part. You have Jordan Mason, who is a 5'11", 223-pound back, who also got a lot of praise throughout the summer. And you have TDP, Tyrion Davis-Price, who is the rookie that they use a third-round pick on, who is big, he's explosive, uh, he's not necessarily like shift or great on third downs, but I wouldn't be surprised if either of those two backs end up being the guy two weeks from now. So Jeff Wilson, in his own right, is not good. In, right? If we didn't have Debo, if this was just Jimmy G still, if this was Jimmy G and we saw that Debo only had like one or two carries last week, I would be a lot more bought in on the running back situation in San Francisco. We also don't know how this committee is going to shake out. Is Jeff Wilson going to get 18 carries right away? No, he's not as explosive as Elijah Mitchell. You have to give a guy like Elijah Mitchell that many carries. You know, he was on pace to get a lot of carries in the first game before going down with the injury. I don't think Jeff Wilson provides that for you. So Jeff Wilson is a guy who, of course, if he's on your waiver wire, I would throw like 15 ish percent on it because he's probably going to get a very big workload for at least like a week, two weeks, three weeks. But don't be surprised when this is literally a five way running committee between Debo and Lance and Jeff Wilson and TDP and Jordan Mason. Like it's going to get messy. So I would sprinkle it out between those three guys. I would kind of diversify the revenue. Jeff Wilson, Jordan Mason's probably the guy I like the least as a talent, but 
He's also a dude I would throw something on, okay? So Jeff Olson is the priority here, but I wouldn't go spending more than like 20% of your fab, even if you're an Elijah Mitchell guy. I would sprinkle like three to five on TDP. I would sprinkle three to five on Jordan Mason and kind of just see how that situation plays out. We're also going to have to watch to see what happens with Najee Harris, who re-injured his foot or ankle. We don't really know with fucking deals. The x-rays came back negative, so it's nothing like catastrophic, but that does not mean that he didn't re-injure like what he was already dealing with, the Liz Frank foot injury that he had throughout the summer. He left the game, and then Jalen Warren, the dude who's his undrafted player, uh, who's been getting a lot of hype all summer, has moved into the RB2 slot. Once Najee left the game, Jalen Warren was the dude that got all of the touches. Jalen Warren is five foot eight, 207 pounds, runs a 4.55 40-yard dash. He's not necessarily explosive. He's undrafted. His burst score and agility score are very, very low on the totem pole, but he can catch the ball. He was a uh, pass catcher in college, which means it kind of works with Mike Tomlin's, uh, you know, workhorse theory, gameplay, whatever. He usually uses a workhorse, a guy who plays on all three downs. Seems like that's going to be Jalen Warren, but it also seems like Najee might not miss any time. So if you're a Najee owner like I am in the E-Town get down, I'm probably going to spend a decent portion of my fab on Jalen Warren just to have him. So I know that I have like that low end RB2 to secure that spot for me. I'm again, not going to blow more than like 15% on this dude because I don't think he has like long standing high upside if something serious were to happen to Najee. It's going to be something weird where like Benny Snell gets fucking involved and it's going to get disgusting there. I don't know how good this offense is to begin with. So it's ugly out there. But again, I'm not going crazy because most of the reports about Najee have been semi optimistic, right? So I think he ends up possibly playing this week. And if we keep moving down the running back list, I mean, Dontrell Hilliard out in Tennessee, I get that he had a couple explosive plays, but he was still very, very much like way behind Derrick Henry, obviously. Uh, if you look at Josh Larkey's tweet, Dontrell Hilliard is fool's gold. Great fucking word usage. 21.9 PPR points, two touchdowns. He was out carried by Derrick Henry, 21 to two. Even Derrick Henry ran more routes, 14 to seven. So he doubled him in terms of routes. So Dontrell Hilliard is actually a dude that... I don't necessarily know if I'd call him fool's gold, but I do think that he continues to get more and more involved in that passing game that clearly needs more, um, clearly needs more playmakers. So I kind of like Dontre Hilliard in PPR leagues, but again, he's not a dude that you're spending more than like 5% of your fab on. We can keep moving down the list. We have a bunch of guys in tiers together. We have Jamal Williams, who I know everyone's going to get like, think people think they're like so smart saying that Jamal Williams is like a cool standalone flex play. I, again, people are going to say Jamal Williams is the goal line back there. If you watch the game, most of those goal line carries came directly after DeAndre Swift broke a big play. So they might have been giving him a breather. Do I think that it might be a committee on the goal line? Sure. Do I think DeAndre Swift ends up with fewer goal line carries than Jamal Williams on the year? I don't think so. I think Swift is the goal line back there if it was just a normal drive where they ended up on the one-yard line and it wasn't like a 50-yard play or a 27-yard play and then Jamal Williams came in. So Jamal Williams, his floor... People are going to say his floor is great. It's not great. Like, he had, like, 20 fucking four rushing yards. He is very, very likely, he is just as likely to give you three fantasy points as he is to give you 15 fantasy points, okay? So, Jamal Williams is cool. I'm not blowing money on him. He is the handcuff to DeAndre Swift. So, if you do have DeAndre Swift, I would feel better about owning him, but he's not someone I'm going out of my way to grab if I don't own DeAndre Swift. Uh, Rashad White should not be available on any fucking waiver wires, but if he is, he would he might be my number one waiver wire pickup this week. If you look at just how heavy the usage was for these Tampa Bay running backs, it was insane, okay? They ran the ball at a rate that was so much higher than last year. The running backs were just un Uncle Lenny in himself. I don't know if he can hold up touching the ball 25 times a game throughout the course of the season. If he goes down, it is Rashad's, Rashad White's backfield in a backfield that's going to score points, in a backfield that's going to get a ton of touches. Rashad White, I feel like, is going to be, I think, if I had to put money on it, Rashad White has multiple RB1 fantasy finishes on the year weekly fantasy finishes on the year. He's a dude that I think has longevity and has upside to really win you your leagues at the end of the year. Unlike Rex Burkhead, who I get it, there was so much hype on Pierce that this seems crazy that Rex Burkhead became the guy for week one. And it was shitty because the game script should be in favor of like Damian Pierce. I do think it just like, I, this is a crazy take, but I feel like Houston was almost surprised that they got ahead so far that they just wanted not to fuck things up. And I think the way that they thought not fucking things up would come would be by playing Rex Burkhead, who is a veteran, who is not going to fuck things up. He knows how to pass protect. He knows how to run routes. He knows how to carry the ball without fun. Like he knows what to do in situations where they should not fuck the ball. So I don't think they want it to get cute. And at this point, maybe Damian Pierce is a little bit of a cute option for them. So while I still love Damian Pierce, the talent, if you could buy low on him, I would certainly look to do that. Uh, Rex Burkhead is definitely a guy that you could play as a flex play because it seems like he's going to get double digit touches in games, at least for like the next month or so going forward. For sure. They clearly, clearly trust him. Kenyon Drake, Baltimore Ravens guy. 
I'm not touching the backfield, right? I was wrong on Mike Davis. You could drop Mike Davis, but Kenyon Drake does not give me any confidence. The run game looked horrible. Uh, they need J.K. Dobbins back bad. I don't know if we're going to see that for another couple of weeks, so it's unfortunate. But yeah, Kenyon Drake, I guess, is on there if you're super, super duper desperate. We move over to the wide receivers. Okay, so there are like two guys or two names that I think are very interesting. It's Jarvis Landry, who's probably mostly highly owned in leagues, but if he's available, Jarvis Landry would be my number one waiver wire target this week. It seemed like Jameis absolutely loved this dude, and Jarvis looked very as much Jarvis as he's looked in the last five years. So really like Jarvis Landry. He would be my number one wide receiver pickup this week. And then the Washington Commanders duo are guys that they're the two that I feel like if someone on this entire list really hits their upside, it's going to be one of these two guys. It's Curtis Samuel and it's Jahan Dotson. Curtis Samuel had 11 targets. Jahan Dotson only had like four, but he turned three, turned them into three catches and two touchdowns. Jahan Dotson, very, very crispy route runner, similar to Terry McLaurin. Very, very, uh, he's undersized though. He's a downfield playmaker, but I could see him becoming like a real possession receiver where Curtis Samuel is kind of in that like Debo mold. And I guess this Washington commander's offense has more weapons than we gave it credit for. Uh, if I had to put my, to, I don't know, I, I I would flip a coin to be honest with you. I think like Curtis Samuel will provide more value over the next month, but I think Jahan Dotson has a higher ceiling going forward for the rest of the year as he gets more and more acclimated against NFL speed. So those are the two that I actually have more upside than the rest of the players on this team. Uh, for the Chargers, because Keenan Allen's out with the hamstring injury, Josh Palmer and DeAndre Carter are kind of interesting. DeAndre Carter's been in the league for like fucking 45 years. He's 29 years old. He's a small, undersized, slow slot receiver. So I'm not going to get like hyped on him just because we saw him have a few big plays on red zone, even though he did look good. Josh Palmer is probably the next guy up getting more play, getting more routes just all over the field. So you want to have players attached to Justin Herbert, of course. So Josh Palmer is the guy for me. I know there's been so much hype on Josh Palmer throughout the offseason and in the summer, so a lot of people probably have high percentages of him owned. He's not a guy that I've ever, like, really thought his talent was, like, overly fucking awesome, but he would be a top guy on this list because of Keenan Allen's injury, which he said he might play on Thursday night. Ain't no fucking way, right? Ain't no fucking way. That's like four days after the hamstring pull. I think he's going to miss at least one week, maybe maybe two weeks. Um, so let's just hope Mike Williams gets 45 targets in that one. DJ Chark had a nice game for Detroit. He's not a guy I want to line up. He's kind of similar to Robbie Anderson in Carolina. Robbie Anderson had led the team with eight targets, had the one big touchdown, 75-yard uh, touchdown. Again, feels like fool's gold. I'm not really buying into either of those like long threats. Uh, moving over to the tight end position. I actually think there are like three to four solid tight end options. We'll talk about Taysom Hill first. Taysom Hill... Went like four for 80 on the ground or whatever. Had a couple big plays, had a touchdown. We also have to remember, Jameis Winston left the game with an injury at some point. And that's why Taysom Hill was in and getting these touches and getting the production. So uh, Taysom Hill's not a guy that I am going after. If he's tight end eligible in your league and you want to roster him, I think that's a good idea. I think there's chances that he has these big upside ceiling games where if you're like desperate at tight end, then whoever you're putting into your lineup probably sucks anyways, and their floor is just as low as Taysom Hill's floor, so you can go for it. But I really like Gerald Everett, Hayden Hurst, and Tyler Higby. Gerald Everett just looked good in his first game. He's a young, athletic, explosive tight end who's trying to find his uh, spot in the NFL, and this seems like maybe the first spot to do it. And now that Keenan Allen's out, Gerald Everett should get a little bit more run there. Uh, had a touchdown pass uh, last game, so I think Gerald Everett could be a player this year for sure. Hayden Hurst looked really good in Cincinnati. He was a guy that I started getting high on as the summer went on as well. T. Higgins is dealing with the concussion. I expect him to be back for this week, but um, I do not know if that's for sure or not. So Hayden Hurst would play a bigger role if T. Higgins is out. So I like Hayden Hurst just attached to Joe Burrow. Again, you want to get good players attached to good teams, good offenses, and good quarterbacks. That's what Hayden Hurst is. And Tyler Higby, man. Tyler Higby was a dude that I was talking up a lot at the end of the summer as well as like an under-the-radar tight end where Robert Woods is gone. His numbers have been pretty good. He didn't turn into a lot of production, but he had 11 targets. I don't think most people know that he had 11 targets in that first game for the Rams on Thursday Night Football. So I think Higby probably had the safest floor of all these guys. I think Everett probably has the highest ceiling. So I think there are some decent options if you are looking for a tight end on the wire this weekend. Hmm, that's a lot of names in a 15-minute span. So that'll wrap up Waiver Wire Week 2. Gold Row Pats bike in store. They're in stock, baby. We've got like 35 of them left, so get them quick. Ikeslunch.com. Link will be in the description. And that's it. I'll see you all tomorrow. Love you. Subscribe. Thumbs up. Skirt.